Hello, and welcome to our reflections now on the upcoming re readings for this weekend, the 13th Sunday of the year, following, as we've mentioned, the sea cycle. The readings for this time, the first reading is from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 16b, and verses 19 through 21. Second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 1, and then verses 13 through 18. And the gospel comes from Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. Now, as we have mentioned quite early at the beginning of this uh, liturgical year, our gospel guide this year is the fourth, the third gospel, Luke. And just a quick little review that the basic message throughout the gospel of Luke is that Jesus is the prophet, Jesus is a teacher, Jesus is a healer. Much of what we have seen, now we're going to begin with chapter nine, and um, I'll start here uh, today. Chapter nine, verses 51, begins a great journey that Jesus will make. He will make this journey from the north, from the Galilee, to the city of Jerusalem. And so in many ways, this is a turning point in, the, um, in, in this gospel. This journey of Jesus will take a number of chapters before he finally comes to Jerusalem. Now he does use the model of Mark, but in this case, we'll make some very important changes. You will remember that there are certain important images that the, this gospel uses. We'll just quickly review them. We will not see them all today, but certainly we will see uh, some of them. Perhaps more, the first one is the importance of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem in the tradition of Luke, and again, pointing out that Luke is a two-part work with Luke, the third gospel, and then Acts of the Apostles as an important part of the whole work. Often it is seen as complementary to the gospel, but really in a way, the designer of this work has put these two whole stories into one whole. And so the story begins in Jerusalem. One remembers that it was there in Jerusalem that the Annunciation to Zachary had been made in the temple that he would be a father. It was also in the temple in Jerusalem that Simeon, when Mary and Joseph had brought Jesus 40 days after his birth up to Jerusalem to the temple, and there, of course, had predicted that Jesus would be a sign of contradiction, a sign of the, for the rise and fall of many in Israel. It was in Jerusalem that when Jesus was 12 years old, he had been found by his parents uh, in the temple. Keep in mind that these stories are only found in Luke. And so from the very beginning, the heart of Jesus rests in Jerusalem. And so now, as verse 51 of chapter nine begins, Jesus takes this long journey uh, to Jerusalem. It will, as I mentioned, take nine chapters before he reaches uh, Jerusalem, and of course then will be greeted, and we have seen this part of Luke's story uh, in Holy Week uh, on uh, Palm Sunday when Jesus enters the city of uh, Jerusalem. Jesus is now going to visit, if one wants, Jerusalem, but it is there already that he has predicted to his disciples that things will not necessarily go so well. And so as he begins this journey, he brings with him 
and we will hear this spelled out over the next weeks, he brings with him three kind of groups, if you want, who associate, take part of his journey. First, of course, will be his disciples. Um, they are the inner circle. He will be teaching them, helping them to understand what his mission is. The second will be the crowds. Um, some of these are summoned as Jesus goes along to repentance and conversion. Others are simply there listening, watching what he is doing. Although Jesus will be teaching more on this journey than healing, there will be some events like that also taking place. And finally, the third group, this is an emerging set of adversaries spearheaded especially by, in Luke's story, the Pharisees and the lawyers. So when you kind of look at this, this following of Jesus as he makes the journey um, to Jerusalem. Now we say up to Jerusalem, but really um, <clears throat> it will be in a certain way down to Jerusalem because the Galilee is in the northern part of, it, of Palestine and Jerusalem is in the southern part. So what has preceded this just a little bit in chapter nine is that Jesus had earlier predicted that uh, the Son of Man will suffer, die, and will rise. This pattern of three predictions, of course, was developed by Mark, and uh, Luke will use this, but expand on it to his own uh, particular needs and interests. Also in chapter nine is the transfiguration story. Now, interestingly, one of the details in the transfiguration story, as Luke remembers it, is a little bit of a dialogue <clears throat> that takes place between the two figures who meet with Jesus on the, uh, on the hill. One is Moses and the other is Elijah. Moses, of course, representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. And the little dialogue that takes place there is they're discussing with Jesus what he is about to experience when he comes up to Jerusalem. So my kind of point to notice here is how much Jerusalem fits into the uh, story as it uh, unfolds. This journey, as I mentioned, will be laden with tension and foreboding. And Jesus, uh, as the opening section that we hear this time, sets his face toward going uh, to Jerusalem. As I said, most of the time, Jesus will be speaking more than acting, and we will hear um, over the next few months uh, some of the marvelous parable stories that Jesus tells in this section, known as the journey section of, um, of Luke uh, as he goes along. So how does this uh, all begin? It begins by um, Jesus, of course, once again reaffirming his, reaffirming his disciples that he is making this journey and he intends to go through the territory of the Samaritans. Now this is a kind of interesting. This would, there are two sides, you remember, to the Jordan River. Most Jews coming from the Galilee, that is the north, going down to Judea, would cross the Jordan and go down on the eastern side and then cross over again, avoiding the territory of the Samaritans. Luke pictures Jesus as staying on the western side of the Jordan and making his journey, going through Samaritan territory. Now, two of his disciples go ahead, kind of preparing a little way for Jesus to make this journey through the Samaritan territory. And they report back to Jesus that the Samaritans will not let them pass through because they hear that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Now, we've not mentioned this before, but perhaps this is an opportunity once again to review the fact that the relationship between the Samaritans and the Judeans had experienced hard times for almost 700 years prior to Jesus' time. 
And uh, although both the Samaritans and the Judeans um, acknowledged Jacob as their common, common patriarch, as you remember, the th three great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they did see that as the common connection, but uh, tension developed uh, early on. Sargon, just a little bit of history here, the Assyrian defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in the year 721 before the common time. Now you will remember, again, all of this is, I'm sure, a quick review, that when King Solomon died, uh, after one of the three great single kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, a uh, division between who should take over for uh, Solomon took place. One was a relative of Solomon, another was a very popular leader, and this divided the kingdom of Palestine into the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judea. Um, so when the northern kingdom falls, um, many who were part of that kingdom were uh, led away uh, to, uh, uh, Pat, uh, to Assyria territory and um, the deport, deport, departed native population went one place, but then they resettled the, with aliens um, and what took place then is that with those who were left behind and those who came in, intermarriage took place. The Judeans also fall, fell to the Babylonians and in the year 537, before the common time, Judeans returned from exile, from Babylon, under the aegis of the Persian government. All of that we have looked at before and it's important to keep as kind of a background to what is unfolding here. The Judeans um, rejected the invitation on the part of the Samaritans to help rebuild the Jerusalem temple. The temple in Jerusalem, you remember, had been built by Solomon. It was considered to be at the time one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And when the Babylonians had uh, taken the city of, uh, not only the city of Jerusalem, but the whole uh, accompanying territory, had destroyed the temple of Solomon and um, uh, burnt the city. So now when the uh, exiles return, and there's all kinds of books within the Old, or Old Testament Hebrew Bible explaining the efforts to rebuild and would be rebuild what is called the Second Temple. And the Second Temple period will run from 530 to its destruction in the year 70 of the common time. But when the Samaritans wanted to be collaborators in rebuilding, uh, the Judeans said no. So now there was again a, a, a tension between these two groups. Keep in mind, Samaritans were partly uh, Jewish, but this intermarriage they felt had rendered the Samaritans impure, and therefore they were not really true Israelites. In the year six, 323, uh, Alexander the Great had died, and a group of Samaritans who had been disfranchised by the Greek rulers, that is, of course, um, Alexander was a Greek, rebuilt uh, Samaria, now not just a territory, but was a city, and um, created an ancient city which they called Shechem, S-H-E, C-H-E-M. And eventually, because they could not have help in the temple built on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, built their own temple uh, called Mount Gezerim. Uh, and this, of course, um, caused a great deal of tension between the two groups. Both claimed that they were following Moses' way. Both claimed that they were offering legitimate sacrifice. The Judeans said it can only be done in Jerusalem. The Samaritans said it could be done at, um, at Mount Gerizim. Later, Pompey, 
the Roman general, when he entered the Holy Land, um, captured the city of Jerusalem, but he tended to favor the Samaritans and he helped rebuild Samaria and make it stronger. Again, you can see the tension continuing to develop. Herod the Great, of course, who um, was the ruler of Israel from the year 37 BCE to his death in 4 uh, BCE, uh, t tended to build further city help to the Samaritans, and there he really irritated them. Uh, Herod, of course, had a loyalty to Rome, built a temple in Samaria to Caesar Augustus. Uh, Herod hated the Judeans, and uh, he even named uh, a city named Tabaste, which honored was the Greek title for honoring the Roman emperor. So if indeed you're, get, you're getting a lot of uh, history here, you can see how this is building up a real tension that existed in Jesus' time. Um, this was further aggravated, and keep in mind that the story that is remembered here by Luke is written sometime in the 80s of the common time, but this was further aggravated by the fact that during Passover time, sometime between the years six and nine of the common time, some Samaritans had snuck into the temple in Jerusalem at Passover time and spew bones throughout the uh, whole temple area, thus disrupting the Passover observance for that year. So that really aggravated the Judeans. Dead bones were considered to render everything impure, and of course there were many there to celebrate the Passover that year, and that aggravated the uh, situation even worse. In the year 51 of the Common Time, Samaritans in a village of Gemma, murdered a Judean um, Passover pilgrim. Now some say it was one, others say it was a number of pilgrims who were, of course, season of Passover coming up, en route to Jerusalem. The Judeans retaliated by massacring an entire village and burning it to the ground. The Roman emperor, a, I'm sorry, the Roman governor of that, that time, Cuminus, avenged the Samaritans by punishing Judeans, who in turn persuaded the uh, Syrian governor of the area to punish the Samaritans and banish Cuminus. So all of that, I know, gets a little involved, but explains why when uh, the news that Jesus and his group, so I mentioned the group, <clears throat> by the way, who also included women in this group, Luke is very careful to point that out, wanted to pass through, said no. The two disciples, James and John, say to Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them out? Now, the response to Jesus, just uh, to, to um, uh, get ahead of the story, is that they perhaps, James and John, had missed the teaching of Jesus, who you remember had said, if when you bring the gospel or the message, they do not accept you, shake your dust off your feet and move on. But <clears throat> James and John would seek to do something violent, why? because the Samaritans were proving to be so inhospitable. We've mentioned a number of times the importance of the quality of hospitality, of welcoming the stranger, of, wel of making them feel comfortable, and of even offering them protection until such time as they passed on. So Jesus here, <clears throat> rather than responding to their invitation, to call down fire and to destroy his opponents. Now, there is a uh, Hebrew background uh, in that. One remembers that uh, at the time of Abraham, when the city of Sodom and Gomorrah had been inhospitable, 
And that was the quality that brought about their destruction, that fire had rained down from heaven and Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. So there was this history there. There was also a history, and this now brings us perhaps to the reason why um, <clears throat> the first reading uh, this time is uh, included for our consideration, namely the story of um, Elijah. Elijah had brought down, remember, fire from heaven and had destroyed the temple, or the offering rather, that was made by the uh, Baal priests of Jezebel, and fire had on another occasion been something which uh, Elijah had brought down from heaven. So um, everyone is <laughs> engaged in bringing down fire and brimstone to kind of solve problems. Jesus, fa faithful to his teaching, says no, just because they're inhospitable, just because they will not accept us, we will find another way uh, to make our, continue our journey uh, to Jerusalem. This is followed now. Okay, so that's that, that episode, but we're introduced a little bit here already to Elijah. We'll see him in a moment here that um, <clears throat> Jesus now, three different people uh, say to him, and this will be the part of the section that we listen to in uh, the story this week, um, will say, uh, Jesus, uh, follow, I will follow you wherever you will go, says one man who comes up to Jesus. So three people are gonna come up to say this. First says this, okay? And Jesus responds and says to him, well, you know, um, I have no place really uh, to rest. Like, unlike the foxes and the birds of the air, I have no place to rest my head. So if you choose to follow me, it's interesting in a certain way, you will choose to become homeless. You will not have a permanent place in which to rest. And, um, uh, so that's the response that Jesus gives to this first uh, man. Now it's interesting that he uses the term foxes because in this same gospel later on, when Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, was seeking to uh, kind of check out on Jesus, Jesus calls him the fox. So whether or not there's a connection between that reference on the part of Jesus and his reference here about foxes, um, those who interpret the scripture kind of say there may be a connection. Certainly it sounds like one. The next one is that uh, someone comes up, uh, Jesus says, follow me. Um, uh, Jesus says, uh, um, but, 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 but before I follow you, let me go back and uh, say goodbye uh, to, to my father, to my family. Now here, let us stop and see that there is some reference to the first reading. The first reading from the book of Kings, first book of Kings, deals with the question of relationship between Elisha and Elijah. Now keep in mind, they sound similar, but they're different. Elijah, of course, is the famous prophet who had tangled with King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who had won, as we mentioned, at the uh, sacrifice at Mount Carmel, who had unfortunately uh, harmed the priest of Baal. Jezebel had gone after him. He had run and hid on Mount Horeb. Uh, the presence of God had taken place there. Um, the doubt, drought, rather, that Elijah had predicted uh, was in place, finally comes to an end. But um, Elijah now is coming to the end of his own uh, ministry, and he needs someone to be a successor. And that's what happens. As Elijah is moving along, he sees a man plowing in his field named Elisha, 
and throws his cloak on him and chooses him to be his successor. So um, Elisha says, well, I will follow you, but let me go back first and say goodbye to my family. And Elijah says, okay. And he goes back and Elisha slaughters 12 oxen yokes. And this would indicate that Elisha was rather well off. And he kills all of them, prepares a feast, a farewell feast for his family and for the farm in which he was working, distributes uh, so that a number of people must have eaten because if you think of it, the number of oxen is very large. Then he leaves everything behind and goes to become, well, <clears throat> at this point in the story, not so much a, a equal with Elijah, but a servant to Elijah. This will later, later rather change when, um, you remember, Elijah is taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot and Elisha will carry on the ministry of Elijah. In fact, there will be more stories sometimes told about Elisha than Elijah, these two great men. But the, the point being is that before he follows Elijah, he says goodbye to his well, to everything, if you think of it, to his family, to his property, he certainly leaves behind all that would be considered important in, in that place. Jesus, however, now returning to the gospel says, let the dead bury the dead. Because the man says, I need to go back and care for my father. Now, keep in mind that that was a kind of prescript of every good Hebrew, that they would take care of their parent, particularly their father. So the man says, I will follow you, but only uh, after I have taken care of my father, who, and then till I bury him. Well, now at first glance, it sounds like his father is dying, and is Jesus so harsh that he doesn't want him to be able to take care of his dying father? It, that would be rather severe. But it could well be that his father is not dying, but rather that he wants to take care of his father until such time as he would pass on, and then this man would come and follow Jesus. No, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must do it now. And so the immediacy of following in Jesus' message is uh, important. Not who knows how long it might take before his father would pass on. So you see um, the phrase, let me go first and bury my father, at first sounds quite nasty, nasty unkind, but maybe is not uh, in, in that regard. And so uh, finally, um, Jesus earlier on had said, follow me. And people have different excuses as to why they are not able to immediately follow Jesus. So when we put this little section together now of the gospel that we have heard uh, this time, the great journey of Jesus has begun. The kind of difficulty with the Samaritans, although keep in mind that in this gospel, this is not the end we hear of Samaritans. But Samaritans will often become very important heroes in the stories that Luke has Jesus uh, described. The famous Good Samaritan, which we will hear later on, of course, um, is, is important. The Samaritan who comes back of the 10 lepers who are healed comes back. And so in this gospel, although there has been a tension between Samaritans and Jews, Jesus will, by his teaching, suggest that there needs to be a healing and a stronger relationship between all. And so this is a kind of a preview of that. And finally, the importance of following Jesus is let's not make excuses for not doing it, says Jesus. Follow me, but there will be risks. And we will hear some of those certainly over the coming weeks 
as the story of Jesus as Luke remembers takes place. So once again, these are the readings for this week. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you again.